Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to feast upon your word, to meditate on it. Oh, what a privilege. We thank you for that bold access that we have to approach the throne of grace in time of need. I pray for all of those who are going through difficult circumstances, trials and hardships, that you would grant them peace and comfort and strength. I thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done in our lives, for who you are and all you've done. I ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant, foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're just about to wrap up the 22nd chapter of Revelation. I think that maybe by the next video we will have completed this study through this marvelous book. I uh, want to begin this morning with... Uh, uh, a certain section of the 22nd chapter. Uh, this section that deals with uh, our Lord's coming. We've seen a lot of, uh, take place. Uh, we've, we've covered a lot of ground through this study. We've seen, basically, we've been taken through the tribulation period into the, the coming of the... Uh, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, uh, the, uh, uh, we looked at the great white throne judgment, the creation of the new heavens and the, and the new earth. And verse 6, we read, He said unto me, this is the angel speaking to John, These sayings are faithful and true, so God's word can be trusted. It's not the, the, the words of the messenger, but he's just the messenger. And there's an emphasis there on our privilege, the privilege that we have to trust him because he is faithful and true. And the reason that he is faithful and true is because God cannot lie. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now, you could say that this is referring to the book of Revelation, or you could... I, I see that we have two options here. This could refer to the book of Revelation alone, or this could refer to the entire Bible. And I, I'll just I'll leave that to you to decide... If you take a look at this contextually, the context is uh, the end of things is at hand. And we've been looking at the book of Revelation. This is limited, in other words, to strictly to the, the book of, of Revelation. The, the word keepeth is guard. It's tereo in the Greek. We guard the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Do we not guard the sayings of the prophecy of other books? Well, of course we do. And we are blessed, made happy, made fortunate if we do. So I want to suggest that, that we this, this may, and, and I guess I'm going to sort of straddle the fence here on this, and say that there is, it pertains to both. Strictly, contextually speaking, it refers to the prophecy of the book of Revelation. But there is application, certainly there is application to all of Scripture, because we guard, and the same author wrote, John, the same author, or the Holy Spirit through John wrote, that if we guard his commandments, that's, that being a first-class condition in the Greek, uh, since you guard his commandments, which we do. Every believer guards his commandments. And uh, without getting it launching into a long sermon on the, the distinction between law and grace, 
We know that we walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. We don't live according to the law and doing His commandments. The word there is not poieo, do, it's guard, it's keep. Uh, it's, it's translated keep in the uh, King James. Many of the other English translations as well will use the word keep, but the word is literally guard as a prison guard, guards a prisoner. We guard his commandments, and they're not just limited to the law of Moses. Or, or I'll even go as far as to say it's not limited to all of uh, the do's and the don'ts. You know, do this, don't do that, and all of the rest of that. Uh, we are actually commanded. Uh, in fact, one of the first commandments that we have in the New Testament is in Romans 6.11. Uh, it's a command, and, and it's also a command that we guard, or should guard, and that is that we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Blessed is he who guards the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And, and of course, I understand the word. It's, it's prophecy. And uh, Romans 6.11 isn't, isn't strictly referring to prophecy. But there's prophecy all throughout the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. We've seen in this text that His coming is soon, that His coming is without delay. It's, his coming is at an appointed time. It's the word, the word that's used there for time in reference to His coming quickly or His coming soon is not chronos in the Greek. That's where we would get our word chronology, uh, chronological time. It's kairos in the Greek. It means strictly means at, at the appointed time, at God's appointed time. And we'll, we also see uh, without delay. Uh, there's the connotation there that, that he's coming without delay. When, when, when all of these things occur, his coming is going to be without delay. Doesn't mean he's going to come at that instant or at that moment. Uh, I mean, there were people back in the, through history, I go back to the 16th century, go back to the second century, you know, uh, Revelation being written uh, somewhere around 95, 96 AD, say in 200 AD, in the year 200 AD, uh, they were reading these words, I come quickly. Uh, He's coming without delay. Uh, and He's coming at His appointed time. These prophecies so overwhelmed John that he bowed down to worship before this messenger. Now, whether you take this messenger as a uh, created uh, angel, an unfallen angel, which most do, or whether you uh, as we've seen throughout this study, that the word messenger often refers to a human messenger. Or whether this was one of John's brethren. I'll leave that also up to you. Uh, I tend to take it as, as just simply at, on face value. I simply take it as an angel. Uh, I believe the text bears that out. But John was so overwhelmed uh, that he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed him these things. Messengers are fellow servants. These angels of God are fellow servants. Uh, and everybody just about understands that the angel told Daniel to seal up the words of the prophecy that he was given. And so automatically Christians, their, their minds go back to Daniel 
when when they read uh, in verse 10, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. That 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 uh, time at hand, meaning the word there is kairos, not chronos. Uh, meaning appointed time, God's appointed time. Seal not. Don't seal up the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I, I don't see necessarily why we even have to go back to Daniel uh, with this. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's even any real connection to Daniel because of, of the, the time frame that we're looking at here. We're looking at a time frame in which there's uh, certainly these prophecies are not to be sealed. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And that one verse right there, that's uh, verse 11. That is verse 11. Chapter 22, verse 11. That one verse has probably sparked more discussion and, and even caused more confusion, I believe, uh, than, than just about any other verse. How could that possibly be saying? Now, that there would ever, ever come a time where that God would say, all right, there's no more chance of, there's no more opportunity on the part of unbelieving men to accept, quote unquote, Jesus Christ to do something to be redeemed. I mean, wouldn't the Lord, even at the final last moment, uh, consider a, a person's willingness to repent? Wouldn't he, wouldn't he consider that welcome? That's, that's the question here. Let me just tell you that uh, emblazoned across verse 11 is God's sovereignty. Now, given the context and given the time frame that we're looking at here, I think the most simplest approach to understanding that what the Holy Spirit, the thought that he's trying to convey is, is that we are at a point in time, you know, we've seen the great white throne judgment. We're, we're, we've seen the, we, we've looked at the creation of the, of the new heavens and the new earth, the, the new holy city, the, uh, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, new Jerusalem. We are so close to the end here that it only makes sense that, that God would say this. our minds tend to, to go into somewhat of a, the, the thought of, well, what the, what the Holy Spirit is, is really saying here is that men are in a fixed state at this point. At this point, they are in a fixed state. Now, we know that those who have been made the righteousness of God in Christ, those who stand before him holy, uh, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, spotless, without blame, where there's no judgment for those in Christ. That is an unchangeable state. But it's easy to see that. Now, it's may, it may not be so easy to, uh, for, for many Christians to see that. Many Christians will argue against that. But the weight, the, the, the evidence of Scripture is in, is in support of the idea that the believer, once 
he has come to understand that Christ died in his place. That first and foremost, the, the fact that we come to understand the truth or believe God that, that Christ died in our place is a separate reality from the fact that he died in our place. Uh, Paul did not realize that Christ had died in his place, I don't believe, until his conversion on the road to Damascus. Every one of us, folks, all of you out there listening to me, and I have to include myself in this, every single saint, every single child of God, all down through the history of the entire history, spanning the entire history of the human race, no one has ever been done anything to merit God's salvation. And I, and I use that, that word salvation loosely. I'm really talking about redemption, whether Christ died in our place. It is because Christ died in our place that we were his, that we came to believe in him. Scripture is absolutely clear on that point. The question here in our minds is, what is, is the Holy Spirit, what is the thought that he's really trying to convey here? When he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Is the Holy Spirit saying that these are in a fixed state in which time has run out because we're at the end of the clock, so to speak? The clock has run out. Is that what that's saying? Or could it possibly be that this has always been the case at any time? And I understand that contextually we are looking at a verse which is in a con the context of a period in the book of Revelation in which time is running out. The words let, the word let, or the words let him is, is what I find most interesting about this. When you when you mention the word let, you're you're basically what you're what you're saying is you're you're saying allow, you know, uh, allow him that is unjust, uh, let him be unjust still. That's if you're looking at the human uh, side of the equation here. If it's if it's God that's doing the letting, he that is unjust, let him. God's going to allow him to be unjust still. Okay? And then you have the, the, the uh, converse of that. You have he that is righteous, God's going to allow him to be righteous still. I, I guess... And maybe I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this. Maybe some of you kind of understand what I'm sort of driving toward here in the sense that because verse 11 is, is so uh, just so shines with God's sovereignty, which is a fact supported by all the rest of Scripture, that I'm willing to suggest that uh, because we can't do anything to cause another person to become a child of God. Uh, I think that we've been sold a bill of goods. I think that it is a myth to su the the myth, the fable here that I think that that men have. Over the, down through the centuries have bought into this cleverly devised fable that says that somehow that you and I as believers in Christ, we can do something to get others to become children of God. If we'll just 
you know, do the right things. That somehow that, that God is depending on us to do that. And that if we just do the right things, and if they do the right things, and if they listen to us, and if they do the right things, they'll become children of God. John 1, I believe John 1.13 states clearly that we were born again by the will of God, not, not by the will of the flesh. That it, which is supported by an abundance of other scripture, which declares that it was God himself, God himself, the Father gave us to Christ as a gift. We didn't do anything to earn that, to merit that. And as a result of the fact that we were his, we, we are, were one of his sheep, that at God's appointed time, and that's that's important to realize it's it's there's a lesson in that it's everything is at God's appointed time it doesn't matter whether whether we're talking about his coming again it doesn't matter if we're talking about our new birth it doesn't matter if we're talking about anything in between that everything occurs at God's appointed time uh Verse 12, following this saying of let him that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. We see, behold, 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 I come quickly. I come quickly. And my reward is with me, and I want you to not miss the fact that what he does not say is he does not say, Behold, I come quickly, and your reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. Now, you may think I'm nitpicking here, and you may, you may think, well, let's see, this is just a matter of semantics. Or, you know, it's the English translation has sort of thrown us a curveball here. At what he's really, really saying when he says, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man. It, it says to give every man according uh, as his work shall be. So the reward that he's bringing with him, okay, is our reward. But folks, that's not what the text says. The Holy Spirit could have easily said, and your reward is with me to give every man according uh, as his work shall be. And the Holy Spirit did not say that. He didn't say that. And I think there's a good reason why he didn't. There is a, an inseparable connection between our works, our rewards, and the reward that it's and I, I know I'm gonna totally uh, mess this up trying to explain it folks dearly beloved listen to me when you tie it all together when you when you look at the fact that Christ is our life not our example that we, li we walk in the spirit, not the flesh, that we live according to grace, not law, that he's the vine, that we're the branches, that we can produce nothing on our own, that it is Christ in us, not I, but Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I live, yet nevertheless, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's Christ manifest in and through our mortal bodies. It is Christ that there's... We have no righteousness in and of ourselves, but all righteousness is of the Lord, that, that righteousness is produced on, in an experiential level. It's produced in our lives on the basis of faith. It is faith's righteousness, the genitive 
makes it absolutely certain that that righteousness belongs to faith. It's faith's righteousness. Faith owns that righteousness. It's a righteousness based on faith, not law. And we are rewarded. We will be at Bema. We will be rewarded for what? What? Uh, individual works? No. The word is singular in the Greek. I've pointed this out before at, at the judgment seat of Christ. Our life's entire work, singular, will be judged. And I believe that is how we built on Christ. How we built our theology on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And it is impossible in my mind to take and separate his work from ours because we walk in the works that God prepared beforehand. That, that is the works that we are to walk in. Uh, we walk, we stand, we rest in the perfect, finished work of Christ on our behalf. All glory be unto Him. He alone, worthy of all glory. There is nothing in ourselves, nothing, 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 nothing in ourselves worthy of, condom, uh, of commendation apart from that which He has done in and through our lives and that by faith. Anything other than that goes up in smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. At that, that, that judgment in which we is a refining process where that all of the, <clears throat> the impurities are, are burned away. That which was done in the flesh, which leaves only that which was done that Christ did through our new man. Uh, the, the flesh profits nothing. So my reward, he says, is with me. Our work, any good works on our part, is intrinsically connected to, cannot be separated from the perfect finished work of Christ. And did Christ receive a reward for, for his faithful service? He absolutely did, us being a big part of that reward. In fact, I think the greatest part, if not the entire part, his reward was you. And his reward is me. He says, I'm Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Again, we see an emphasis on the Word. We know that Christ is the Word. And repeatedly down through these verses, the emphasis is on Jesus Christ, the Word, the living Word. Blessed are they that do His commandments. No. That's a King James flop. If you look at the original text, the original Greek says, Blessed are they that wash their robes. Wash their robes. Well, how did we do that? Again, the focus is being the Holy Spirit is driving it back to the Word, Christ being the Word. He's the living Word. We're studying the written Word of Christ, who is the living Word. And so it's not doing His commandments. Uh, the word do is poeo in the Greek. The, 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 very, the, the entire phrase is not there in the original text. It is literally washing our robes. It is, it is, those are, these are the individuals. Those who have, their, their robes have been, they, they, we stand before God clothed, in the very righteousness of God imputed unto us, the righteousness of God in Christ. Uh, the word robes in the Greek is, is from, uh, it's a Middle Eastern term, describing the robes of the elite. 
Okay. Now, whether this is talking about justification, initial, you know, being made the righteousness of God in Christ, whether you want to look at it that way or whether you want to look at it in, 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 the, in the sense of, of growth, spiritual, the outworking of that uh, growth in our lives, spiritual growth in our lives. I'll leave that up to you as well. Uh, Jude, I know Jude talks about... Uh, that we snatch a brother out of the fire, hating even the garment that's polluted or stained by the flesh. John himself, John, the same author here, human author, talks about our walking in the light in the context of fellowship. So this is not talking about justification, but it's talking about fellowship. And if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us of all sin as we walk in the light. So is this talking about that type of washing? I'll, I'll leave that to you to decide. I can tell you that I, I personally believe that this is referring to those who have washed their robes in, in, the, in the sense that they have, we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. He was raised, he was delivered for our offenses, he was raised because we were made righteous, because we were justified, which is a good point to make given the fact that we just ran over Easter and everybody's minds is on the resurrection. So it, these are the ones that are blessed because they have a right to the tree of life. It wouldn't make sense to say that only the good Christians have a right to the tree of life or only the good Christians may enter in through the gates into the city. That does not work at all. And he contrasts these with those who are without. Without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. These are the make up the, the primary characteristics of the old, unredeemed, unregenerate nature, the fallen nature of mankind, those who are not redeemed. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever, who, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Without cost. Freely doesn't mean well, just, you know, uh, see there, Steve, you know, we can take, we take the water of life freely. Uh, you know, anyone can, uh, can become a child of God. Just, they just have to will to, to become hard enough. They got to want to enough. If they just simply want to enough or will, will to be hard enough, or if they're, if they have the desire, if the desire is, is, is uh, if they truly have the desire, then uh, they can take of the water of life freely. The word is without cost. You and I, being children of God, those for whom Christ died in our place, those whom the Father gave to the Son as a gift, that, that all that the uh, Father gave him will come unto him, that no man can cometh, come unto him except it be given him by the Father. These are those who may take of the water of life freely. Now, uh, There are, that there's probably, I don't know how many articles I've, I even have in my own library that's been written on the gates. I, I want to spend a moment at least uh, just talking about uh, these gates of the heavenly city. Uh, I, I do know that 
Gates are mentioned at least a half a dozen times in these last two chapters alone. Even though we see that the, the mention of Gates all throughout the Old and New Testaments. We know that, that Christ, the Word, can't separate the two. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, you know. So we can't separate the two. Christ, the Word, He is the gate. He's the gate. And, and it, you know, it's, I, I'm amazed at how gates are so often referred to in both Testaments, both the Old and the New, as, and, well, and, and as a side note, not, not wrought iron gates. You know, I've, I don't know how many pictures I've seen of some cartoonist would, or some artist would, would portray the, the gates of the heavenly city as wrought iron. You know, and St. Peter's standing there, and he's kind of got this, he's behind a podium, and he's got a book and to check to see if you're, you're you know, if you've been good enough to, to enter into through those wrought iron gates. I don't know where artists come up with such concepts as this. I, 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 it truly amazes me. I mean, the text clearly says that they're pearl. But, I'm amazed at the times in the Old and New Testaments that they're used uh, as it's used as a metaphor for for Jesus and the Word, as well as the Kingdom of Heaven, which is uh, more precise. We see that in the parable that Jesus gave. There's at least 98 references to gates that I, I counted. Uh, a, a, it's a beautiful description of God's desire to fill us with His presence. Of, of, it's a beautiful description of Him being the only way, the only source of redemption. That He's the way, the truth, and the life. That no man cometh unto the Father but through Him, through that gate. He's He. It's that. It's the same uh, thing that. We see it in, in God's protection of His people, where the shepherd sits in the gate. He sits in the gate, not stands by the gate, sits in the gate to protect His flock. It's a, He, uh, truly, truly, I say unto you, uh, unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Uh, I think ever since uh, we were little and, you know, going to vacation Bible school, we just about every one of us, uh, you know, remembers hearing about entering into uh, his gates with thanksgiving. We know that we don't cast our pearls before swine. Uh, pearls are uh, the word clearly tells us that wisdom is greater than than pearls yet these gates are made of pearls it's three on each side you know typically we think of you know a gate is well he's it's a single gate or it's a double gate that swings open these are three pearls on each side i'm not even going to to make an attempt to, or a venture to guess what this looks like, whether, you know, these, how that these three pearls on each side of the heavenly city are situated, whether, you know, whether they go vertically or horizontally or diagonally, but there's three on each side. What I find interesting about just the, other than the fact that the gemstone, the pearl, is, it represents the month of June. What, what, I, what I find really, really interesting about it is, is that uh, pearls are, are the only gemstone that come from a living creature. And each one is unique. 
These heavenly gates, folks, of pearls are forged. We know wrought iron is forged through fire, uh, judgment. We know that. But these are forged through in this just as much through adversity adversity uh suffering uh irritation uh inside the shell of the oyster or or the mollusk uh what a beautiful picture of the suffering of our lord these pearls that are, that are gates in the heavenly city each individual pearl I don't see how anyone in eternity or during the, the thousand year reign of Christ, anyone entering into those gates, I don't see anyone how anyone could gaze upon these gates without realizing the immense suffering, tremendous suffering and irritation. What it took to form those gates, because we know that the greatest suffering than any single person ever endured was the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's created through years of irritation within an oyster. Uh, I, I look at the Bible as a string of pearls uh, because of its association with wisdom. Wisdom being said to be of greater value than pearls you know you know if i just the idea being you know you hear it a lot today you know well man if i just if i just do enough if i just do dot all the i's cross all the t's if i just suffer enough then i'll make it through those pearly gates When the suffering of our present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed unto us. And we don't suffer. Our, it was not our suffering that created the gates to this heavenly city. But the suffering of our Lord. Now it's true that we share in the same suffering in this life of rejection and difficulties and hardships and trials i'll grant you that but we did not have anything to do with creating the gate whereby we in a glorified body enter into the presence of god whether through the thousand year reign of christ or or throughout eternity there's something interesting about this heavenly city, and that is, and I pointed this out before, it's only, it can only be entered into through resurrection. Only those in glorified bodies can enter into this heavenly kingdom. I got a message, uh, I think, from someone uh, recently. They asked, you know, who is it that populates the kingdom after this after the seven year tribulation period is over well, it's obvious that those who are alive who survive that period who are believers who are children of god those which are because there's a judgment of the of, that takes place where the, the sheep and the goats are are separated from one another it's the sheep of that period who enter in to populate the kingdom at the end of the thousand years at the very end conclusion of that kingdom age those who will populate the new heaven and, and the new earth are likewise those for whom christ died but i want you to understand something about just the subject itself of resurrection you know we're, we are at a point where we're looking so forward to the redemption of our bodies to be to be raised with Christ, whether we're dead or, or we're alive. And in past time, we were. Well, 
There's even been a book written on this title by I.E. Maxwell, Born Crucified. We were born crucified. The uh, John, well, I, you just name any of them. Let's take Paul. Paul on the road to Damascus prior to his conversion. Prior to his conversion was a child of God. He was born crucified. He was born raised from the dead. When Christ rose, Paul rose with him. Now don't don't get confused and don't don't let your mind get all muddied up with with this thinking down the wrong path of, of trying to figure out, well, how in the world could Paul have been crucified when, when Christ was crucified? And how, how could he have physically uh, rose from the dead when Christ rose from the dead? I'm not talking about him being physically crucified or physically raised with Christ from the dead, but spiritually, the text makes it clear that we were born crucified. You, as his child, was born crucified. You were born raised. In fact, you, you died with Christ. You were buried with Christ. You were raised with Christ. And you are now co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Well, that means you ascended with him as well. You've been so closely identified with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you've never been apart from Him. Now, that's in the past. Now, when we talk about the present, we died to sin. We died to self. We died to Satan. We died to the law. We died to the world. We, In fact, we died to death itself. Death no longer has a hold on us. We were raised to walk in newness of life, His life. We live on the resurrection side of the cross, not the back side of the synoptic gospels, which was Christ delivering his message, his good news of the coming kingdom in which Israel, his people, he came unto his own, his own received him not. They rejected both the king as well as the kingdom. And Israel was set aside in unbelief so that you could experience the love and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I. So that salvation would come to the Gentiles. But in the meantime, in between, we daily, we die daily. We die daily to self, to sin, to self, the law, the world, Satan. The flesh, folks, profits nothing. We possess His life now. We were born again by a very special process. We came into contact with the Word of God. We were raised to life, quickened to life, regenerated, given His Spirit, Christ Himself, the very, in fact, the very fullness of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit came to take up residence within you. It's, it is a foolish notion to suggest that you could ever do something. One of God's pe people could ever do anything to cause God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to, to, to take up, to pick up, and leave and depart from your life. It's utter foolishness. You were created anew. You were given a new nature in which He united Himself together with you in that new nature, which is sinless, which cannot sin. Because He couldn't be touched or tainted by sin. Now I'm talking about the flesh, the old man, which we are to reckon ourselves dead to, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And now we've got something future that's, that's involved in all this. And that is whether we live or die, we'll be raised to meet the Lord in the air, whether we live or whether we die. If you turn to Philippians 3.10, it's one of my favorite verses, uh, 3.10 and, and 3.11. You have the Apostle Paul stating, and keep in mind, the Apostle Paul knows Christ at this time. So you have a, you have a messenger of God, the Apostle Paul, who knows Christ, saying, oh, that I may know him. We're not looking at an unregenerate uh, prior to conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul, who's saying, oh, I'd like to know him. He knows him, but the word there is not, it is gnosko, it's an experiential knowledge. Paul is expressing his desire, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who wrote this for, for both the, the, the benefit of Paul as well as us, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection. The power of his resurrection. What the power, folks, that it took for God the Father to raise Christ from the dead. That same power works in you, okay? To raise you from the dead. I'm, I'm not talking about in the future. I'm talking about right now. Sure, it's, it's true of, of the past, present, and future, all three, but I'm, I'm talking about right now. It's the same power, the, the same power that, that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you and me to bring us to where that we walk in newness of life, His life, not in oldness of the letter, which is law. That's the power. You know, and, and so many Christians say, you know, look, unless we keep the law, we can't possibly make progress. The real progress, folks, is, in, is seen in the power of God who raised Christ from the dead, which works in us. Which raises us to life, to, to walk in newness of life, his life, not our own. Because the flesh profits nothing. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship. To have in common with the same sufferings that he endured at the hands of sinners. Being made conformable unto his death. Death works in us, but life in you, says Paul. If I seek to try to save my life, to preserve my life, to put my life first, then I can't see God working in me to where that I see life in others. Being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And, and you're going to tell me that Paul is talking to the, well, he's referring to the possibility that he might be raised physically from the dead? I don't think so. No, what he's talking about is that he might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not in some, at some future point, but in his life right then. The word that he would walk as a raised, resurrected saint, child of God, dead to the law, that he might bear fruit unto God. That's what the text is saying, Philippians 3, 10 and 11. And the word resurrection there is not the same word. It's from the same root word, but it's not the same word used in reference to Christ being raised from the dead. The word resurrection is a very unique word. It's used only once in all of Scripture. All of Scripture. You won't find this word anywhere else but here. It means out resurrection from the dead. It is custom to that to that passage, that verse, that context, that thought, 
It is very especially designed to this verse. The out-resurrection from the dead. That is what we long for in this life. We long to experience in this life as much of what we're going to experience in the future. At least I hope that's the case with you. It should be. Because there's never one instant in our lives, in our walk, in our talk, in our relationship with Christ, in which He's distant. In which we have to live in fear, of const in constant fear of whether or not we're performing enough. If our performance doesn't match up to someone else's standards. We can rest in the perfect, finished work of Christ. That word is, it means completely out from. It, it, it intensifies that word that's used of Christ's resurrection. Rising up to experience now, at the present time, that full impact of resurrection life that's, that is thoroughly removed from the realm of fleshly service or law, law keeping as a rule of life, as a customary uh, acquaintance throughout this life. I can, I can gladly tell you that there, are very, there have been very, I don't know if I should even say this or not. Folks, I don't remember what it was like honestly don't as a Christian to ever walk according to the flesh or according to the law. I'm not saying that I don't do that in my day-to-day -day walk. I'm not saying I don't do that. Of course, we all do to some extent. But theologically speaking, I always knew that it was wrong. Right from the very beginning, I came to understand that it was Christ who, who was my life. That it wasn't my life serving Christ. Christ as much as it is him living his life in and through me, which was my service, my sacrifice to God as a living sacrifice. We have, dearly beloved, we have been so closely identified with our Lord. I do not have the words. I could, I could do another 500 videos. And I would not have the words to adequately describe what it means to be so closely identified with Christ. And, and I'm not talking about just past, present, and future. I'm talking about something more circular, something more other dimensional, something more eternal. We know we have eternal life. The only reason we have it is because we're in the one who's eternal. He had no beginning, no end. We are in the one who had no beginning, no end. No wonder he says he foreknew us before the foundation of the world. Well, I've strayed really far off text. I apologize for that. I do want to say that I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you for all your messages, your your kind messages of love and, and your prayers for the direction of this ministry and for your support. I will be putting out here in the next few days a, uh, an update on uh, a spring, uh, our spring timeline and where, where I believe we stand in relationship to our Lord's coming because it is near. Until then, rest in Him and thanks for watching.